Well, aloha, and thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Ryan Kalesuji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii here on the platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Great to see so many of you already tuning in this morning. And again, this is a show where we spotlight some of the issues and newsmakers uh, of course, making headlines in our community and the things that are impacting the people of Hawaii. And today, Yanji, we are joined by two guests who uh, are familiar with this show to really focus on tourism and its impact uh, to our economy, but also how COVID-19 has impacted the whole tourism industry. That's right. Uh, we are very lucky this morning to have Mufi Hanneman, president and CEO of the Hawaii Tourism and Lodging Association, along with Jeff Wagner, CEO of and president of Outrigger Hospitality Group. Gentlemen, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Let's start with the news of the day, and that is Oahu moving to Tier 3. Um, Mufi, I would just like to get your thoughts on what this means to the members of your organization. Well, uh, thank you again for having us on the show. Great to be with Jeff Wagner, one of our industry leaders here uh, in the state of Hawaii. Uh, we uh, want to say kudos uh, and applaud the efforts of Mayor Blanjardi uh, in being able to move us into Tier 3 and then also making some very meaningful modifications within that Tier 3. I can say that uh, uh, this was uh, much anticipated. and I think we also have to give plaudits to the community uh, for helping us to get to this level here because we had to have a certain average uh, that would enable us uh, uh, to be able to move to tier three. So it's a hopeful sign. We now will see a lot more activity taking place, not just in the hotels, in restaurants, in retail, and even church services. Uh, and so I really think that this is a great move. We also uh, know that this will give impetus to a group that's been formed recently called the uh, Conventions Coalition. Uh, the, Eventually, we'd like to get there, but we know everything takes time. Uh, we all have to do our part, uh, and certainly uh, this is welcome news uh, for all of us here, and uh, kudos to Mayor Blanjardi for hitting the ground running uh, to provide this. And I think the key in going forward, of course, is that the community has to do its part. Wear your mask, observe the social distancing rules that will still have to be applied, uh, and let's not leave it to the law enforcement officials uh, to always do the police. And we can all do our part by reminding our neighbor, reminding our visitors uh, that uh, this is very important for us to adhere to. And Jeff, what about you? What are your thoughts on moving into tier three? Uh, it's uh, great news for us. Thanks again for having me as well. And a and, uh, pleasure to be here with, with you too, Mufi. And Mufi said it incredibly well. I mean, this is important for us to be able to, to move into tier three, uh, to be able to have uh, Mayor Blanjardi, who really has a great business mind. Uh, he's not only looking at the political side of this, he's looking at the business side. And to make those tweaks that he did with restaurants and things like that really are going to help our business in, in a pretty big way. So, you know, we're excited about what this means. I, I agree 100% with Mufi that we've got to do the right thing. We've got to continue to keep cases down. I think we've got over 300,000 people now with a vaccine, which is tremendous. And so those that might be vulnerable, hopefully have that vaccine and that we won't have any issues there as well. Yeah. Jeff, I want to ask you, what are you seeing specifically with your hotels? Obviously, Outrigger has a big presence here in the islands. And uh, we've seen over the you know past year how things have changed with this pandemic. Have you seen a steady increase in the amount of visitors that are uh, on your property? And what are some of the things that you're noticing uh, on the various outrigger properties here in Hawaii? Yeah, Ryan, it's a great question. And, and we really are seeing an uptick in business. And the majority or almost all of that business is coming from the mainland. We're already back to, in, in pre-pandemic levels, 70% of the travel that was coming from the mainland. So that's a really super sign for us. Uh, on top of that, one of the things that we're seeing is people are staying longer. And we've actually gone to people that are on island that are in our hotels today and said, would you like to stay longer even at a discounted rate? And we've had regularly people say, I'm going to add another two or three or four days to my trip because they can do that with the way that they're working today. On top of that, Kamaaina business continues to be strong for us. Uh, the past two weekends for the industry in general have been very strong, and we continue to see an uptick there. So some good news uh, definitely for the industry. Yeah, Mufi, I have a similar question, which is what are you hearing from your members in terms of the profile of the visitors who are coming to Hawaii right now? Um, I would imagine that we're not seeing families in the way that we had in the past, but who, who actually is coming to stay in Hawaii? Well, first of all, I think we're getting the kind of traveler uh, that we'd like to see in the long term. They recognize 
uh, that we're going to uh, adhere to and emphasize some strict health and protocol standards. Uh, you have to do a pretest uh, to get here. It's going to cost money to do that. And when you get here, uh, you may have to quarantine uh, if one of the rules uh, that we ask you to abide by uh, are not done uh, prior to your arrival, I should say, when you arrive here. And so certainly um, it's a different kind of traveler we're getting here. We also have shifted uh, to really try to emphasize that we want travelers coming here that respect our culture, uh, respect our environment, and know that we want them to participate uh, in making this a better place. So many of the hotels, like Outrigger, are giving incentives for people to get involved uh, in Malama type of projects uh, so that they can uh, give back to the community and they know that um, they're also creating a very positive feeling amongst our local residents. And Jeff was correct in saying those that are coming uh, because of inclement weather conditions on the mainland may not want to return uh, as, as quickly as perhaps we used to see in the past of a five day visit here, they're extending it and they're doing it willingly because they're getting a, a very positive experience when they come here. So I think this all uh, is a really good sign in going forward in the kind of profile of the visitor that we want uh, to come here, a high quality traveler, uh, that's going to do all the right things and then, of course, embrace our culture and, and our people will follow suit by welcoming them here as well. We want to bring in a question here from Cyrus, who's asking, uh, how are the HLTA's recommended policies and guidelines impacting the current and future Trans-Pacific travel uh, restrictions in hope of turning around the economic uh, recovery? Uh, Mufi, if you can speak to that, uh, how are you folks helping to shape some of the policies that's happening right now? And is there anything specifically that you would hope that the state would consider uh, when it comes to trans-Pacific travel and, and, and if that is lessening any sort of restrictions or any changes to the current policy, uh, if you can speak to that. Yeah, you know, like with every program, you know, th there's always uh, some areas that could use some improvement. You could tweak a little bit and so forth. So we're still getting um, incidents that are occurring where people will come here, not have their results uh, uploaded, uh, and um, therefore uh, are being asked to quarantine immediately. And sometimes when this is a family, a family of four or five, where uh, four of them uh, had their results uploaded, the fifth one did not. And when they arrived, they told they have to quarantine. Uh, so that often casts a pall on that whole vacation experience. So we'd like to see an opportunity uh, for a second test to be done. Uh, we know that Honolulu has that capability at DKI Airport, thanks to the city and county of Honolulu. We know on Hawaii Island County, they do that at the Kona Airport. Uh, to give that visitor who, through no fault of their own, went through a trusted partner uh, and did not have their results uploaded by the time uh, that they uh, were boarding the plane to come here, uh, we'd like to give them a second chance uh, and not have to go back as some of them. In fact, some of them are even going back uh, to get their results within 72 hours and then come to the island. So you can imagine the cost of being able to do that. Uh, certainly, there's another bill there that calls for a one statewide policy. I think that bill is worthy of discussion and merit, and we've sort of gone on the record to kind of support that. We know every county wants to have their own rules sometimes because they're all different, but I think we need to shift the conversation now and strike a better balance between having strict health uh, protocols and standards and then start to open up the door economically uh, to have quality travelers come here so that the rest of the businesses in our community can benefit. We belong to a coalition called the Hawaii Travel and Business Coalition made up of HLTA, the Chamber of Commerce, the Hawaii Ag Foundation, retail merchants, the airlines. Uh, and we know um, many of our small businesses are gonna uh, continue, have been struggling, will continue to struggle. Uh, so we just need to have a, a little tweaks and modifications to be able to, uh, for us to fully take advantage of the fact that we are different now when you come here. We're going to ask a lot more of you, but in return, um, uh, we're, we're going to give you a good time when you come here. I have a question for both of you. I'll start with Jeff, and that's on this whole idea of the vaccine passport. What do you think, uh, what kind of a difference could you, do you think that that would make for the willingness of people to come here and just the ease of travel? The Lieutenant Governor was on here and had set out some specific timetables saying March 1st for CISA workers, uh, or CISA exemptions rather, uh, April 1st for neighbor island and then May 1st for Trans-Pacific. The governor pushed back on that when he was on saying that he didn't want to commit to any timetable, but just the idea of the vaccine passport. Uh, Jeff, we'll start with you. What, what kind of an impact do you think that would make for your customer? 
Well, I, I really do think it's going to make a significant impact if we can get to, to that stage. Uh, when you think about what's happening now is it appears that our hospitality employees are going to end up in, in the 1C tier. So at some point here in the very near future, they will start having the opportunity to have a vaccination. And so if during May, for example, we're able to get all of our employees vaccinated and we can at the same time start allowing customers to come in who have vaccinations as well, that's really the opportunity that we need as an industry, I think, to have travel really rebound for us in a more robust way. And Lucy, same question. What kind of difference? Yes, uh, we certainly embrace uh, what Lieutenant Governor Green has laid out as an aspiration, as a goal, as an objective. We think it makes a lot of sense if we can have uh, vaccinations uh, to the point uh, where um, very important factor there that Jeff brought up that we want to make sure that our workers uh, are considered part of this essential category uh, because of all the front-facing responsibilities they have. Uh, and then most importantly, um, be able to come to Hawaii and perhaps not have to do a pretest, perhaps not to have to quarantine because we're making it very easy, much easier and much more accessible uh, for you to get here. So we like that idea. We think it's a worthy goal uh, and we'd like to see it come to pass. You know, Jeff, I wanted to ask you specifically, we know that this obviously has had a impact on your overall financial uh, budget with, with the closure, the impact that it has had on uh, just the amount of employees that you employ and, and the resources that it takes to keep this hotels operational. Uh, has there been any talk of any federal support, uh, anything where you uh, as a you know business owner of all these hotels or anything from the financial standpoint from the federal government that might be able to, provo uh, to provide to assist? We're seeing these you know uh, allocations that are going towards specific companies and, and entities like airlines. Has there been any talk for the hospitality industry in, in terms of support and how are you managing the overall finances during this time? There, there is, Ryan. There, there's a lot of support out there for the industry. And, you know, there's, there's PPP loans out there that are for everyone today. And there's still money available on the PPP loan side. Uh, that's the second tranche. There potentially is even a third tranche if that money is used. Um, our own Brian Schatz, actually, our, our senator, state senator, has also propose some legislation or is in the middle of doing that, which is a Save Hotel Jobs Act. And there's n several components that, that are in that that could potentially help the industry, not just here in Hawaii, but across the entire US. And then AHLA, um, who is the American Hotel and Lodging Association, uh, they're in Washington, D.C., and they're with the, the House and Senate on a regular basis making proposals to be able to support the industry. They're working on a really interesting proposal right now with the House and Senate on grants for hotels that uh, would be provided if they've lost 50 percent of their occupancy or more over a three month period of time. And the majority of all of us in Hawaii have uh, kind of triggered that particular piece of, of that legislation if it gets approved. So there's numerous uh, pieces of legislation out there that we're working on and that people are working on to be able to support the industry. Um, Anne Maria Medeiros has a question here. Mufi, I wanted to ask this one for you. The travelers coming in now are coming on the cheap. What happened to less visitors but big spenders? Um, I mean, presumably the flight that they got here was cheap, but do we know about their daily spend? Well, you, you know, we don't control the uh, the airline pricing of the tickets and the like. It's up to every airline. But we do know, even if they did have a cheaper airfare to come here, there's a requirement that they have to do the test. Uh, so that's going to add to that cost. And sometimes when they get here, also, they may have to stay longer because it's not that easy to get back. So um, we we like to see a quality traveling come here. who's going to spend money and go around. But I think one of the best ways to get at that is something that we've talked about in the industry uh, is the folks that come here and will stay uh, at short-term rentals that are not legal. Uh, those are the folks that I think we have to be really careful about because if you stay at a hotel, obviously we have security, uh, we adhere and we comply and we cooperate uh, with all the rules and objectives that the state and the counties are asking us. Sometimes it's not that easy to do that uh, at a short-term rental. Uh, where it may be deemed illegal. So we're okay with the short-term rentals as long as they're in areas that they're legally uh, permissible uh, and the like, uh, and they're doing that. So um, travelers come here, they'll have the option of staying where they want to stay. We have price ranges across the board, but we do know it's much more expensive to come and stay in Hawaii now uh, than it's been in the past 
uh, when we were having 10 million visitors plus come here. You know, when when you think about um, what Mufi just said, you know, 10 million visitors, it, it feels like a lot. And we know that. Um, and we all want there to be responsible tourism. Honolulu and, and our market here was 30th in the country in 2018 for number of visitors. Um, number 29 was Portland and they were double us. Orlando was 90 million visitors. So there's a piece of this that's about managing tourism correctly here that does come here. And between Mufi and John DeFries at HTA, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to make sure that we're educating travelers when they come here on how to uh, take care of our land and, and our people and, and what's happening here in Hawaii. So this is a big uh, we're putting a lot of energy behind this right now because I believe, you know, that 10 million number, everybody's been talking about that. The reality is we just need to manage it correctly and make sure that we're doing the right things for our land. You know, I also want to bring up when you when you talk about managing and, and making sure that the guests are uh, well aware of the rulings that are in place here in Hawaii. One of the things that uh, happened last week in Waikiki, you guys had a press conference down there announcing some of these new signs that went up that promoted uh, physical distancing as well as mask wearing. Mufi, what are you seeing in terms of guests uh, in Waikiki and beyond the tourists? Uh, are they adhering to the mask ruling and, and how has that been received? Well, I, I can tell you this, we are all, uh, we have a laser uh, focus on this uh, from the airlines to our travel partners uh, who impress upon uh, that prospective traveler of what's expected when they come here in terms of the three W's of wearing a mask, washing your hands and uh, of course, watching your distance. And then here locally, um, Outrigger Hotel has, has been one of the leaders. Uh, you go there, you'll see signage there. Their employees are reminding folks uh, that they have to adhere to these social rules. Uh, and at the same time, they're leading by example. So the signs, the banners that you see now in Waikiki serves as a reminder uh, to not just visitors, but local residents. You know, I, I do daily strolls through Waikiki, sometimes twice a day, once in the, uh, midday and then in the evening. And, you know, I'll see as many, if not more, local residents who are not uh, wearing their masks. And so the Honolulu Police Department uh, really embraced uh, this fact that we're making it very visible on those lampposts banner, uh, uh, lampposts by having these banners there. And uh, certainly uh, Mayor Blanjardi uh, and his predecessor, Mayor Caldwell, were able to provide um, CARES Act funding for those banners uh, to be uh, designed and we have it up there with the help of the city. So we all have to do our part. And all this means, uh, again, is uh, you a know, strict reminder to all of us, we have a responsibility. We shouldn't just leave it to the Honolulu Police Department uh, to enforce the rules. We can be a good neighbor, be a good brother, be a good sister, that if we are gonna go into the tier three and hopefully we'll get to tier four and beyond, uh, we have to obey these rules. Dr. Fauci on down, everyone is telling us that's the key to a good, healthy recovery. Yeah, Jeff, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. I just wanted to follow up on that, Jeff. What are you seeing? Are, are you seeing any pushback from guests uh, in terms of wearing masks? What are some of the things that you're hearing about some of the rulings that we have put in place because of COVID-19? Yeah, we're really not getting a lot of pushback. I think people have come to know that that's just the way life is today. And I think I mentioned this on the show last time, Ryan. Um, it is like a total PR no-no to call the police on your customers, and we've done it. You know, the industry literally is taking this seriously, and if people are breaking quarantine or they're not doing the right things, we're going to deal with it. And I think all of the industry has committed to making sure that, that we're doing that. So I think uh, we haven't seen really any significant issues. And as we indicated, or as Mufi said, you know, we've had hotels open through the entire pandemic. We've had one customer out of this entire year that had COVID at one of our hotels. Uh, and that was a flight crew member. It wasn't even a traditional tourist that had come in. And we have not had one employee end up with COVID through this time. So really the employees are taking it seriously. Our customers are taking it seriously. And because of that, I think it's gonna keep the cases down here. You know, we've been focusing on trans-Pacific travel with the with the continent, but I wanted to get your thoughts, Mufi, on opening up to foreign markets. Do you, you know, there had been a lot of talk early on about pre perhaps creating some kind of an agreement with Asia, specifically with Japan or perhaps South Korea. Where does that stand right now? What is the industry looking at when it comes to bringing those visitors? Because we know that they do spend a lot of money and they're a very important part of this sector. 
Yeah, that, that's a little more uh, uh, complicated to navigate uh, those types of approvals and authorizations. You know, local um, travel, I mean, inter island travel, I should say, transpac travel is more of a national uh, objective, concern, as well as uh, state uh, requirements uh, that we ask of them. Uh, on that front, we certainly need um, uh, support from Washington, D.C. Uh, and some of the travel restrictions that we're seeing. And then also a, a good understanding of what's expected from those countries that will allow uh, their residents to come here. So talks are ongoing. Uh, we're seeing signs that uh, uh, it's poised to get even better as things improve in the country from once they came and when they come here. Uh, and so there's going to continue to be certain requirements that have to be adhered to. So uh, we want to see Japanese and Asian travel return. They've been good, loyal customers in the past. They're high quality visitors that spend a whole lot more. Uh, but I think it's like one step at a time uh, and we'll get there eventually as things improve. You know, we are we are seeing that that travels, you know, it's not here and it's probably 30 to 35 percent of our of our travel that comes into the islands. Uh, from these international destinations. And when you look at New Zealand and Australia and Canada and Japan, and you keep going on, we're getting zero of that travel today. And I indicated earlier, we're getting 70% of the mainland travel, but because we're not having that international travel, we are still really suffering as an industry. The industry's running in the 20% occupancy range, and we don't expect that to change in the, in the short term. Although we did just hear that JAL has uh, added a flight in April, uh, from Japan and slowly I think that Hawaiian is adding some flights back so hopefully in the second quarter of this year we'll be able to get some of that business coming back to us. You know we've seen many hotels during this time use it as an opportunity to do some renovations we're seeing it at Halekulani at the Four Seasons but also with one of your properties Jeff at the Outrigger Reef. Uh, how in some ways has this pandemic allowed you the opportunity to maybe upgrade some of your facilities? And what can you tell us uh, about the Outrigger Reef and where you guys are at in that renovation process? Yeah, thanks Ryan on that. And you know, the, the reef is such a special property and it's an incredible location right across from the Halakalani and the Trump and the Ritz. It's a, just a great corridor of Waikiki. So we're looking forward to improving that property. We've got about $80 million that we're spending. We actually started doing the guest rooms uh, pre-pandemic. And then once the pandemic hit, we said, you know, let's just close the hotel. Let's have free reign of the property to touch every inch of it and completely renovate. So it really, you know, it's one of the silver linings, I guess, if you want to say there is one in all of this is we were able to close the hotel and not have the disruption for our customers. But the hotel is looking fabulous. We're really excited about reopening. We'll probably reopen uh, middle of April or early May. Uh, to guests and uh, will be completed with the hotel uh, by the end of this year for sure. Yeah, I, just, a I just want to jump in and say, uh, I really give uh, props and kudos uh, to our properties, uh, to our resorts, uh, to these brands that are going forward uh, with renovation. You know, um, it just shows how they've managed to try to be creative during these times. It'd be very easy for them to kind of sit back and say, well, you know, we have to save our money uh, because we've sustained these major losses during these periods here, but they are pushing forward. Uh, and I think that's a healthy sign. Marriott's doing it. Uh, certainly we've seen it with, uh, uh, with what the Outrigger has done uh, and certainly with some of our other uh, statewide uh, brands and resorts that are doing that. And it also helps the construction industry uh, provide those jobs uh, at a time when uh, we have to make sure as many people are working. You know, there's this discussion in the comments and I just want to bring in two and then get you to reflect on this because it really shows the the, the discussions that are happening in our state. So here we have uh, Daniel saying, you're going to lose out on tourism if you require vaccines, people will just go to Florida. And then uh, Vivian says, if you don't get tourists, this will be an island full of tents. So we have these two, you know, these some people are saying we need to be safer, we need more restrictions, and other people saying we desperately need uh, this economic engine to restart. So, so Mufi, how do we balance that? You know, people who really have some trepidation about welcoming people back, but then others who recognize that obviously um, we need jobs. You know, uh, Yunji, I've said this before, I have witnessed, I've seen, I've been a part of every economic diversification initiative uh, for nearly over three decades and, and then some. Uh, and it, is, it has always come back to tourism uh, for one reason or another. 
So let's not uh, stop our efforts to try to diversify the economy, but let's also be realistic. There's nothing that's going to put people back to work quicker than this industry. Uh, in, a, in a very good solid year, you know, we brought in $17 billion in revenues, $2 billion in tax revenues, and employed over 200,000 people. So until we can find that economic diversification initiative that can either match or replace or what have you, we have to do what we have to do with tourism. And, and that is to make sure now is a golden opportunity for those that want to rebrand it, for those that want to see the industry be much more part of the community dialogue. We're all for that and we're willing and prepared to do that. But we need to keep in mind that if this industry doesn't come back, we're going to be in a major world of hurt. We're fortunate to have a very strong congressional delegation that's very focused on tourism. They're helping us. We're fortunate to have national organizations like the American Hotel Lodging Association. They're helping us. We're fortunate to have some champions here, state and local government. But at the end of the day, I think even they would uh, admit that it has to be tourism here for Hawaii. So I think where we're coming from is quality tourism. Where we're coming is responsible tourism, managing tourism well, not just for today, but certainly so that we can continue to uh, bequeath to our future, future generations, the kind of Hawaii that we enjoy today and that can be sustainable uh, for years and decades to come. And just quickly, in the spirit of fairness, I just got to put up, I, I realized that I put two comments that were very advocating tourist, tourism. I, I clicked on the wrong one. Uh, Ingrid says, good, we don't want that kind of unsafe tourist. Let them go to Florida. So, so Jeff, how do you respond to that, you know, these, this push-pull that is happening in our yeah. community on this discussion? So, Yenji, you and I had an opportunity to be at a conference last week where one of the incredibly astute panelists said, you know, let's not not have tourism, but let's have tourism be the financial bridge for diversification of other industries. And so that is really what we need. Uh, tourism can come back very quickly if we can open back up in a safe way. We want it to be safe. It also creates an incredible bridge. Uh, there are people out there, you know, with Rich Wacker and Mike Akane and Ray Vera and others that are working really hard on diversification. You've got all the major bank leaders doing that. I mean, everybody's coming together now as business uh, to figure out what do we do and how do we do it a little bit differently. But we need that financial bridge to be able to get there and hospitality and tourism is going to create that for us. So I think that's an important element and piece of us moving forward as a state. On the vaccine side, you know, I, I agree. If we said that, you know, you have to have a vaccine in order to come here, um, I think that would tap down travel quite a bit. But I think that's another interim step. When you look at the surveys that are out there today, number one is last week was the first week in this entire pandemic period that people are, more than 50% of the people said they are going to travel for leisure in 2021, which is huge. The number one destination in just about every survey that you see of places they want to go is Hawaii. And so there's going to be pent up demand for us. People are going to want to come to Hawaii, but we want to do it safely. The, one of the reasons they want to come here is because of what we've already done. We've been safe. We are touted as a safe place to visit and people want to come see Hawaii. You know, as our time wraps up here, I did want to provide uh, each of you a final opportunity to share your final thoughts. Uh, Mufi, we'll start with you. You know, as we begin to get people vaccinated, we see these numbers down, we're heading into tier three. Uh, what is your final thought and final message here as we uh, move into this next phase of dealing with COVID and its uh, relation to the tourism industry as a whole? You know, I'm very optimistic, uh, a lot more sanguine uh, today than I was back in 2020 when we were in the throes of this. I think the signs are really pointing in the right direction uh, for Hawaii. Uh, our positive cases are down. Not as many people are being hospitalized. Um, and we as a community, I think, are starting to recognize the importance of, of having this economy come back here. So I think the key in going forward, and I know it's a trite phrase, but it's a true phrase is that we all have to go in the same direction and we all have to do our part. Uh, and, and let's look at this as an opportunity. As I said, every crisis presents an opportunity for us to get better, uh, for us to do things in a way that uh, not only good decisions today, but good decisions in the future. So we're gonna continue to do our part from the hospitality industry. Uh, to people recognize how important we are and we appreciate all the support and patience uh, that folks have out there uh, as we work very hard to get us back on track. 
So, um, you know, I'm going to throw a bunch of acronyms out there that aren't going to mean a lot to everybody, but, you know, between HTA and HLTA and HVCB and all the tourism associations that are out there, we're all incredibly focused right now on responsible tourism and sustainable tourism. And I think that's very important. So when you see all of our leaders in the, the tourism sector stepping forward to say, we're gonna do this right. And when people come in, they need to respect Hawaii and they need to treat Hawaii the way it should be treated. I think you're gonna see a lot more of that coming forward. There's all kinds of messages that are out there today. We've got commercials running that talk about that today but we need to be able to feel it in our communities as well. It can't just be a slogan that we use for marketing. You've gotta be able to feel it that we're actually doing something. And so that's important to me. It's important to MUFI. I know it's important to the entire industry as we move forward. Okay, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. It's wonderful to spend this time with you. We really appreciate you also taking all those viewer questions as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Aloha. Well, Ryan, very interesting there. And I wanted to bring in those comments because I'm, I'm reading uh, all of you writing in and, and, I, and I see the debate happening and it is a debate that, that is largely happening in our community. Um, but you did hear there about the pent up demand. Um, very interesting to know that, you know, over 50% of Americans do want to travel this calendar year. Um, and Hawaii seems like a, a likely destination. Yeah, and you know, also interesting to hear uh, just just overall thoughts about the projections. He's saying seventy percent of that mainland travel, but we're still missing, of course, that large component uh, of the international travel, and when that will start up again. Uh, so we will see how things kind of pan out here. Uh, if you've driven through Waikiki and recently, uh, you'll definitely notice the difference. There are a lot more people. Uh, there than we've seen in the past. I was kind of taken aback when I was there a few weeks ago when I saw the amount of people. Uh, but it, again, it, it's great to see some of these restaurants that are now open again, uh, because for a long time, that area was just a ghost town. And so really, it's just about the recovery efforts that we're hearing that is going underway between these agencies and these hotels that are working to bring things back to some sense of normalcy while also incorporating these changes in the policies for uh, COVID-19. Yeah, you know, and when you mentioned Waikiki, it's interesting, Ryan, because I was actually there last weekend and I hadn't been for a while. And what struck me was that there was a, a decent amount of foot traffic, but there was also so much retail that was empty. And I just thought it was so sad to see all of these, you know, small stores that, that cater to visitors that, you know, employ local residents and often sell things that are produced here in Hawaii. And they were all shuttered down and empty. Um, and, and I thought that was really heartbreaking. And so to hear that our hotels are running right now around 20%, obviously that's not enough, but moving to tier three, as you said, is a, you know, a bright spot and the vaccine is another bright spot. Jeff Wagner saying that um, he believes that many hotel employees will be able to get vaccinated in 1C, uh, which would be coming up pretty soon. That would be around May. Uh, and that would make a big difference for their safety and just for the overall ease for this industry. Yeah, and another way that people are getting uh, visitors or, or temporary visitors, I should say, long-term visitors to the islands is through programs like the Movers and Shakas program, and we'll be talking to them on Friday. Yes, please join us because we know you will have a lot to say. This is a pilot program to try to bring people who are able to work remotely uh, to come to Hawaii for an extended stay. The idea being that you can take that Silicon Valley, for example, that Silicon Valley salary, uh, work here and spend it here. These are, um, you know, a lot of these folks will likely be staying not necessarily in houses, but in hotels for extended stays. So we are going to be talking to the head of that program tomorrow um, and along with the folks from COVID POW to just talk about how this program um, is being put into place. The first cohort, if you will, these folks actually have to sign a contract saying that they are going to do community service and really contribute to our community. Um, but you know, you read about it in the paper and I read those comments too. And a lot of people are really wary of this whole, you know, the way this is being rolled out. So we want to start that conversation with all of you. And, uh, and Ryan, I, I think, you know, the numbers on the applicants, I can't remember, but I know the ratio of applicants and accepted was, was pretty unbelievable. Yeah. They had close to 90,000 people apply for that program. Uh, so we'll hear what that process was like, how they decided uh, to select those that got uh, approved for this program. Uh, we do know that all of them had some sort of Hawaii tie to that. So again, it'll be interesting to dive into that and hear your comments and thoughts about this program and, and what you think moving forward, if this is something that should continue and if they should expand on this program. We'll talk all about that on Friday. Uh, and then we have a number of great other guests lined up as we head into March as well.
Yeah, hard to believe, but we are already heading into March and that will mark a year since the pandemic uh, began, at least here in the island. So uh, a lot of great guests coming up, but please do join us Friday at 1030. Thank you again for writing in your questions and concerns. Thanks, of course, to our guests. We'll see you right back here on Friday at 1030. Aloha.